everybody. Uh, it's so good to, to be with you. Uh, it's been a good weekend uh, for, for me. I've had the chance uh, with many of you to take part in our Abide Conference where we partnered with uh, First Baptist here in town uh, and some other, uh, other churches. And it was really good uh, to be together with uh, some faces that we don't normally see, but to gather around as brothers and sisters. And it was just such a good reminder that uh, uh, what happens here is not all there is, that God is uh, moving uh, in so many different places. Uh, and we were so excited to be able to do that. As a matter of fact, if you were there this weekend, uh, we would love to know a little bit of your stories. We want to share that with the rest of the congregation. Uh, maybe some of this, uh, if you were there this week uh, and God spoke to you in some profound way or just solidified your faith or reinforced or encouraged you, uh, we would love to know that. So catch one of us, catch me uh, after the service or sometime this week, uh, let me know. And uh, we would love to share that uh, with the rest of the, the church family because that's a part, component of what we're doing this year. Our theme for the year is Abide. And uh, we've been learning what it actually means to remain in Jesus, uh, a word that we don't use a lot, uh, this word abide, uh, but we're learning what it means for us to walk in the presence of Jesus uh, on a consistent basis, day in, day out, in all the different facets of our life. And we've been focusing in, in this facet on Sunday mornings on what we call the farewell discourse. And so we're going to be back in that. The farewell discourse is a section of scripture in John's gospel where uh, it basically recounts Jesus uh, and his last few conversations his farewell conversations with those closest to him, his disciples. And he's given them some parting wisdom. He's given them some challenges. And today, what we're going to find is he's also given them some cautions. Uh, he's going to warn them. He's going to temper their expectations a little bit about what this whole story is about. Uh, and he's going to challenge some things for them and try to prepare them because he's, we all have to be prepared for pushback. And so today, what we're going to talk about is being prepared for pushback. We're going to talk about what it means for us uh, in our walk with Jesus to actually be prepared. Uh, I grew up in uh, Cub Scouts uh, early on, and that was one of the mottos, be prepared. Uh, I, I didn't remember a whole lot of other things, uh, but I do remember that. And uh, I think that's been kind of drilled into my, my thinking. I, I, I like to be prepared. I don't like to be caught off guard for things. Uh, does anybody like surprise? How many people like surprises? There's a few of us. Some of you like surprises. How many of you hate surprises? Okay, we're about half and half, all right? So some of you this will resonate with and some of you won't. Uh, I think some surprises are good, you know, a birthday party surprise, okay, that's good. Somebody buys you a nice gift, that's good. To be surprised by an event or a circumstance or a scenario in your life, particularly in the area of your faith, is, and whether you like surprises or not, is not really the most pleasant thing. A matter of fact, this is the thing that uh, I think I found uh, over the years in my own personal walk with Jesus are, are the things that are most confusing, the most confounding, because oftentimes it seems like I'm, I'm trying to do the very best I can to follow Jesus and things are not going well in spite of all my efforts. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but that's, uh, that's kind of the story. And then there's sometimes where I feel like, man, I think you're cruising along and everything's going well, and then all of a sudden things shift. And some of those are circumstantial. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is not just the circumstances of life that you might have to endure, okay? It's not just, hey, I, 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 I caught COVID or something like that. This is talking a very specific form of pushback. This is a very specific circumstance, and it has everything to do with expectations. What do you expect when you follow Jesus? And when we dive into this passage today, I think what we're going to find is that what Jesus wants to prepare us for is some things that maybe we wouldn't expect would come with the package of following Jesus. And as he prepared his disciples, my hope is that he would prepare us. And, and, and uh, over the weekend, in these different sessions, I was able to teach three different sessions, and we did the same thing every time. We were just praying that God would help us to actually know what it means to abide in him so that we could more closely reflect his image to the world around us, that we could follow in submission, obedience to him, and so that the world would actually know this Jesus, who we have learned is a very good God. And we started this whole journey together, just as a quick reminder, because this is going to set the stage for us in the first sermon of the year, when we said that what God is preparing us for is greater things. But it's really important, and we've tried to hit this every week, is how we define what greater things are. Because greater things for you may mean a lot of different things, okay? There's some greater things that you wish you could have in your life. Uh, I would probably classify those as better things. What Jesus is talking about is something very specific. He's talking about what it means to actually multiply the works of Jesus and to expand the range of his works. 
That means that when, when you follow Jesus, when you abide in Jesus, as Jesus has been training these disciples to do, what he's really talking about here is that your life should manifest in that you should be doing the same times of work as Jesus. And the, the works that he's been uh, relaying to them, teaching them, showing them, has been what it means to actually enter into dark and difficult situations. He, he's talking to them about what it means to actually get your hands dirty the way that God got his hands dirty by becoming flesh with us, to get out there in the middle of it and to say, hey, this is what this is all about. I want to multiply his works. And you have a chance to do that. I have a chance to do that where you live, where you work, um, when you're at the ball field or you're at school, whatever it is. You have a chance to multiply his works. And when you go places, you are in effect expanding the range of his works. What happened uh, in Jerusalem uh, on that faithful day of the crucifixion and what happened at the resurrection and what happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down, it, the ripple effect of that event has now reached all the way to here. But this is not the end, that we are part of the continuing story of what Jesus is doing. And this is what it means to have greater works. But how many of you know that if you ever want something greater, it's going to come with a cost? If you want something greater, it's, it's not going to come easy. There's going to be some pushback. And that's exactly where we find Jesus' next caution in John chapter 15 in verse 18. Watch what Jesus says to these disciples. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. And as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world and that is why the world hates you. Now, this is kind of a familiar passage oftentimes in church. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, when, when growing up, I read the world, I, I had a picture of what that is. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I might, whatever you would label that, that might be uh, uh, some media outlet, that might be what you would designate as pagan culture or secular culture. Uh, and, and in some respects, you're probably right. I mean, uh, there is an antagonistic uh, kind of a, a, in, a environment in the air, isn't there? There's dissonance between what you believe and the pattern uh, of the world. Uh, and, and that's real and that's true. But one thing we like to do here at Journey, uh, and hopefully, I, and I've learned this from the pastor that's at First Baptist, okay, uh, Rodney Reeves over there, uh, I think I, I, I was modeled well in this, is that what we have to do is we have to ask the question, what was uh, the author saying? What was the person that was speaking these words saying? What did he mean when he said the world? Because I know what I think it means, but what did Jesus mean? Who is this world? Well, if you follow along with John's gospel, we're, we're told what this world is. This is the world that he traveled. Uh, he did not travel beyond probably around uh, uh, past just his uh, near geographic area. We know he, as a child, spent time down in Egypt, but uh, he knew nothing uh, in, from a fleshly standpoint of what you're experiencing today. Uh, not to challenge his omnipotence or his omniscience, excuse me, but the idea that he was actually geographically located means that God chose a specific time and place to enter into the story of humankind, didn't he? And when Jesus walked this sod, when he breathed this air, what he, was, uh, what he was encountering was the world of Galilee and Judea. And what he was experiencing were the people in Jerusalem, the people that were close to him, the people that were in the synagogues, the people that worshiped at temple. He came first to the people of Israel. And so sometimes it's important for us to make sure that when we read this, we're hearing what Jesus says and who he was talking to. Because first, he was not writing this or saying this to us, though it's for us. He was saying it to those that were sitting in front of him. And he was preparing them for exactly what he had experienced. So who is the world to Jesus? Well, a few hints, there's a few breadcrumbs through John's gospel that help us to understand who Jesus was talking about. And this is important. Matter of fact, if you back up to the first verses of John 15, we read this last week, it begins to illuminate it just a little bit sharper for us. This is what it says, I'm the true vine, this is Jesus speaking, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. That's that word abide right there. And I also will abide in you or remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
And we talked about this very uh, briefly, and we don't have time to go back to all these references, but I'll put them up here for you. When, when Jesus says the true vine, he actually has in mind, many uh, uh, scholars and commentators believe, he's actually talking in reference as a, as a contrast to the nation of Israel itself. There's a few references you could write down. Just pop all those up there real quick for everybody. Uh, these are a few. If you want to jot them down, you can go read uh, before and after these passages, and they'll kind of give you a little bit of an understanding where this, uh, this idea comes from. Uh, but frequently in the Old Testament, uh, that, which was the Hebrew Scriptures for them, uh, it recounted the fact that when God talked about Israel, he was talking about a vineyard. He was talking about a vine. Uh, and he would transplant this vineyard or he will transplant this vine. And the idea was that the people of God, the nation of Israel, would provide fruit, that they would bear fruit of what it means to be the people of God, and they would be blessed in order to be a blessing to the world. Well, you don't have to be a scholar to figure out. You can just kind of glance through and you could figure out they didn't do real well uh, with that charge, that commission. They, they fell on their face uh, over and over again, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. And then Jesus finally arrives on the scene, the Messiah, the long-awaited Christ. And what does he do? He says, I'm the true vine. He begins to reflect what it actually means to be truly human, to truly embody what it means to actually walk in the presence of God. And John actually, one of his major points is this whole, of how, this whole idea of how Jesus himself abided in the Father and how we now abide in him. Now, this is the idea that permeates script, uh, John's take on the scriptures. Matter of fact, if you go all the way back to John chapter one, and we're gonna follow these breadcrumbs for just a second, and then we're gonna bring it back and understand what it means for us. But if you go all the way back to John chapter one, when he introduces that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And ultimately it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But there's this little part tucked away here that not only is he the true vine, but he's also the true light. He's the true light that gives light to everyone that was coming. He was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now, who were the children of God up to this point, class? Israel, yeah, Israel. Um, the, they were the chosen nation. They were the people set apart. But here's what happens. The true light has now come into the world. And this true light doesn't, we know this now, was not just going to come to the nation of Israel, but as Israel was supposed to be a blessing, this Messiah would be a blessing to all of us. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation would come to know this God because God had made himself known through Jesus. And so if you look at this passage right here, what does it say? It says, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Where did, where did Jesus get the most heat? Those closest to him, those that were supposed to be looking for the Messiah. Where did he get the most pushback? Well, he got it from those that were supposed to be looking for him. The people that had grown up from the earliest stages learning about this Messiah, longing for this Messiah, and then the Messiah, the true light, the true vine shows up and they don't recognize him. And not only do they not recognize him, they actually begin to push back against Jesus. As a matter of fact, uh, there's several instances. Uh, one of the most telling ones for me is in John chapter 7. This is a repeated uh, refrain through John's gospel, but after Jesus heals uh, a guy uh, on the Sabbath, Jesus went around in Galilee and he did not want to go about Judea because why? The Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. We're not to the crucifixion yet. They're already trying to plot, plan, uh, push back against Jesus. The world cannot hate you, Jesus, if you fall down to verse 7, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. In the context of that passage, what Jesus is talking about when he refers to the world is the nation of Israel itself, the religious leaders that were pushing back against him. How, how, we know they were pushing back because they were trying to kill him. They did not like his message. They didn't like the way he went about it. It didn't match up with the way that they thought and understood God to be. This, 
This countered and challenged their presuppositions about God. And rather than actually be challenged and receive the challenge, what did they do? They began to push back against Jesus. And Jesus tells the disciples in that moment, he said, they're pushing back at me and they haven't done it with you yet, but there's coming in a time when I'm not going to be here. Jesus already knows in John chapter seven, he's already beginning to prepare them, even though they're not picking up on it yet, that this is going to be their reality too. Matter of fact, if you skip forward to John 16, which we'll end the passage with later on at the service, we'll just read through it. But this is what Jesus says at the turning uh, from John 7 to John 16 of his, his persecution to theirs. He says, all this I've told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. That's a Jewish place of worship. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. Um, if you've studied scripture in the New Testament, my, your mind might go to someone like the apostle Paul who as Saul persecuted the church. And ultimately, once he came to Christ, he became one that was persecuted by the church. I mean, uh, because he was part of the church. So the part that he was with was this, this group of people, this zealous group of people that were pushing back against this message of grace. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. That's what he says in John chapter seven. Remember, he didn't tell them the whole thing, but now farewell discourse, he's preparing them. He's saying now is gonna be the time when you're about to experience it too. And just like they pushed back against me and they tried to kill me, the same is going to happen with you. Now, let me just hit the pause button for a second. And, and um, you, we, we know this, if we fast forward the story that what, uh, what, what John does is he goes on to tell the story of Jesus going to the cross. And what we find is there's very few people, very few of the disciples, uh, save uh, the beloved disciple and the women disciples that made all the way to the cross. Uh, most of them that heard this very message did not stay with Jesus all the way to the cross. We don't actually see the disciples abiding with Jesus until after the resurrection. The significance of what it means that the Holy Spirit post-resurrection comes and indwells them and empowers them to actually do what God is calling them to do, that the gift of the Spirit's coming, but it has not yet arrived. And in their own power, they don't have the holding power. They don't have the staying power to stay. Why? Because pushback's hard. Pushback is not pleasant. And in our day, when um, culture, our culture, uh, we're built around ease. We were talking about it this morning. We're a drive-through convenience culture. We want it our way. We want it when we want it. And there's something that's woven into our approach to God and to faith that we've got to be aware of. Because a lot of us will come to church and we'll treat it like a coffee shop. We'll treat it like a department store. We'll treat following Jesus like ordering something from Amazon where it's supposed to arrive on your doorstep and you unpack it and it's exactly what you wanted. And if it's not, you just get to send it back. Jesus is preparing them for pushback. And I think it would be good for those that have ears to hear that we have to prepare for pushback too. And if you're going through a season right now where you think, well, it should all be easy, then hear the word of the Lord. He never promised you it would be easy. As a matter of fact, he said quite the opposite. And in John 15, verse 20, watch how he frames it. He says, remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Remember that phrase, he quotes him. He says, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. When did Jesus say that? Well, you remember the episode probably if, uh, if you grew up in church or maybe you've been to a place where they share what we call the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist. Uh, it, it recalls the time where Jesus gathered the disciples in the, uh, in the upper room and, and what does he do? He begins to share a Passover meal with them. He begins to reframe what it looks like 
that he's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shed my blood for you. I'm, my body's gonna be broken for you. And then he begins to wash the disciples' feet. He, he, he takes up and wraps a towel around his uh, waist and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. He comes to them as a servant and he leaves them in that moment with a challenge, a command. And what he had said was, I've set you an example that you should follow as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. There's the quote nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I think what Jesus is perhaps doing here is he's actually trying to confront probably a misconception that they might have taken even from the Last Supper. I mean, it, it sounds great and it's very picturesque. I mean, uh, maybe you've been in a place where they've said, I, you know, take up the towel and serve someone and wash someone's feet. And I mean, there's, there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in service. As a matter of fact, this is not a distinctly Christian thing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of organizations that in many ways better than the church oftentimes serves the community a lot better than we do. Uh, they're serving people around them. They're meeting needs. They're, they're enacting what we would say, well, that's a really, really good thing. And they're doing a good job at it because why? So there's something attractive about service. And they're so attractive, I think, in John chapter 13. It's so beautiful. And Jesus says that it comes with the blessing. That if you, if you do what I'm doing, then you're going to be blessed if you do. Now, the way I define blessing is things are going to go great with me. If I serve and I do what you do, um, it, it, the, the, what I'm going to get in return for that is I'm going to get something good. If I'm going to be blessed, that's not going to be a bad thing. That's not going to be a difficult thing. So it's almost like we come to God in this economy that if I do this, I'll get this. And Jesus confronts it, doesn't he? He says, remember Remember when I said no servant is greater than his master and I said that if you do this, then you'll be blessed in what you do. But it, what he's essentially saying in John 15 is he's saying, hey, that same package comes with a cost. The call to serve like Jesus served comes with a cost. And we don't like things that cost. And this is not just an American thing. This is a human thing. This is a sinful thing. This is a fleshly thing. This is a selfish thing. We, we want things that are given to us. We don't want things to cost us. But Jesus is preparing them for pushback because he says, if you follow me, I just want you to know you, I'm about to go away and it's gonna be you and your life's gonna be on the line and it's gonna cost you. So if you look at that same statement that Jesus makes, if you go back to John 15, he says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So where did this all begin? Why was Jesus persecuted? Can we ask that question? In one of our uh, sessions this weekend, we talked about this, that Jesus was not persecuted and Jesus did not get crucified because he was a nice guy. He, you know, we talk about church, hey, just be a good person. You know, I'm not a good person, which we have to talk about that in a different sermon, what that means. But you know, that, that's the way we frame it, isn't it? A lot of times that being a Christian just means you're a good person and you're trying to do the best you can. But where it began for Jesus were the works of God. John tells us in chapter five, it was because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath that the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. He confronted their misconceptions about God he brought the kingdom of God to bear in reality. And the people that were supposed to be looking for it were the very ones that pushed back against it. And that's hard, isn't it? I mean, this is family. This is friends. These are relationships. This is what Jesus told a lot of them. Listen, I'm going to come and divide households. I'm going to turn father against son. Like the, the, this is hard, this is the cost of following Jesus. And if you want to do the good works of Jesus, if you want to serve like Jesus, don't expect a pat on the back. Don't, don't try to be obedient to Jesus and serve the people he served in the manner in which he served them and expect everybody to get on board, even those that say and confess that they believe in God too. He says, if you're gonna follow me, you're going to get pushback. And this is not the pleasant message I'm sure that they wanted to hear in this moment, is it? 
I mean, up to this point, it seems like Jesus is trying to comfort them. I mean, those passages like John chapter 14, that he's going to prepare a place for you. And when he comes back, he's going to take you to be where he is. But he says, in the meantime, you need to be prepared for the pushback. Jesus is honest, isn't he? He's honest with us. The question is not, has God been honest with us about the package deal? It's whether or not we're honest with ourselves and whether or not we want to receive the message and the challenge that God has put before us, the call and the cost. If you finish the story out in John 15, he says, they will treat you this way, down in verse 21, because of my name. Remember what I told you? They're going to do this because of my name, because you're associated with my name. Now, th this whole idea is because it's not just that you do good works, it's that you do the things that Jesus called you to do in the name of Jesus. I mean, I don't think anybody, like I said, I don't think anybody's mad if you're just a nice person, right? But what does ruffle some feathers is if you do the things Jesus did in the manner in which he did it, and you point to him as the foundation for why, then that becomes the dividing line, doesn't it, oftentimes? And, and we had a professor, Veronica and I, growing uh, up, going through college, and uh, he, he often said, he said, listen, you don't have to be offensive. The gospel is offensive enough on its own, isn't it? The gospel is confrontational on its own. The church, the people of God, the brothers and sisters of the family of God, we don't have to be offensive. We get to be loving. <laughs> we get to serve people. We get to speak truth and grace and love all at the same time, but the gospel, the message itself confronts us. And when it confronts us, the dividing line comes. And he says, because you do it in my name, ultimately, that is going to give you some pushback. And it's part of the package. Pushback is indeed part of the package. But Jesus is almost finished with this little, uh, this little aside in the farewell discourse. He says, remember what I told you? Oh, excuse me. He said, if I had not come uh, and spoken to them, uh, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, this is a little cryptic. We're going to hang out here for just a second. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. And if I had not done among, uh, excuse me, if I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in, the, in their law. They hated me without reason. Now, this is, uh, I, I wanted to explain this because I don't want people to get the miscon some misconception. Because what we would, if you just read this on the surface level, which is always kind of, it's great devotionally, but it's always dangerous to build a theology just over like a kind of an overview of scripture without digging into it, understanding what Jesus was trying to say, and, and maybe reading it in, in line of immediate context and then what he says in other places. Because some would say, well, listen, so I guess up until this point, nobody was guilty of sin until Jesus showed up. Not true. All right? The rest of scripture does not say that. John doesn't even say that, okay? What is he talking about? He is talking about a specific type of sin. And John's gonna help us out with this, but here's, let's just read it one time. He says, spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. And then he says, done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. What in the world is he talking about? Well, John helps us out with one of his letters, okay? And one of his letters, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John 5 this is what Jesus says. See if this helps us out a little bit. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, okay? So, so far there's a sin that does not lead to death and there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, just he wants to make sure you know that. There's everything's sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. Does everybody got it? No, <laughs> right? Uh, this is why we have to hang out. We have to wrestle with these things, right? What does he say? Well, if you read it in context, both of what he's saying in his gospel and what he's saying in his letter, he's referring to a specific type of sin. He says there is a sin that leads to death. The death he's talking about is not just a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death. 
And, and if you follow along with his train of thought, and we don't have time to go through all of uh, 1 John together, but essentially what he's saying is that once you come to life, you can have security in knowing that you have passed from death to life. You stand approved before God. It doesn't mean that you won't sin some more. It doesn't mean that there's not times that you'll sin, which is you know, hard for us. Well, if I'm a believer, why do I continue to sin in these ways? And this is not someone condoning sin. This is not John condoning sin. This is not Jesus condoning sin. But what he is saying is there is a specific sin that you can't come back from. There's only one sin that ultimately leads to spiritual death, and it's actually whether or not you will receive Jesus as the Christ or not. You know, so what disqualifies you uh, from being in a relationship with God ultimately is your denial or your not accepting Jesus as who he claimed to be on the merit of by, that by which he did. Uh, it wasn't that you lied, right? It wasn't that you sinned in a specific way. You can come back from those things, but the thing that you can't come back from is denial of Jesus, and so if you go back to John chapter 15, if you go back to John chapter 15, what did he say? He says, now they are guilty of that sin. Why are they guilty of? They did not receive him. They didn't receive Jesus. The people that had been looking for him, instead they push back against him. And he says, now because of that, I did these words, I spoke these words in front of them. I did these works in front of them. I did all these things. But here's the deal, now they're guilty of the sin that you can't come back from. They denied me, they did not receive me. And they hated both me and my father. That seems pretty extreme. Now some of them did, like physically hate him, like I mean, I hate Jesus, I'm gonna try to kill him, you know. Uh, and there were some people that I think just turned away from him. And, and you see that. Uh, there were some people that turned away from Jesus within the nation of Israel um, at times when he would say hard things. Like there was that time where he said, if, uh, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And they said, this is too hard of a teaching. <laughs> and they turned away. And Jesus turns to the other disciples. And he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, he says, no, where else are we going to go? You're the only one that holds the words of life. You see, this is what it's about. This is the dividing line is what do you do with Jesus? And oftentimes we make it about so many other things. We try to make so many other qualifications. And Jesus says, ultimately, when they see my works and they hear my words and they don't respond to those, that's just the thing you can't come back from. And here's the deal. When you go out into the world, I want you to expect that there's going to be difficulty. It's going to come with a cost and there's going to be pushback. And I think the message for me, like in this time, is uh, to temper my expectations of what the blessing of God looks like in my life. Don't define it by worldly measures rather than heavenly measures, the way Jesus defines it. Because ultimately, what did Jesus do? Jesus died to go to the cross. He gave up his life to take up a towel and wash someone's feet doesn't mean just doing an act of service. It means being willing to die for them. And even those that would turn away from you. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. But while we go into this area, this new frontier of following him, the beauty of it is that he doesn't send us out alone. And so I'd like to read over Jesus' next words. I'm not going to preach through this, but I want to read it over us today. Because Jesus gives them the key for the pushback. He strengthens them and he says these words in John chapter 16. He said, all of this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said all these things. But very truly, I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. 
Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear right now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And that's why I said the Spirit will receive, you will receive from me what he will make known to you. Though we have pushback, we don't have to go through it alone. God will be with us and he gives us one another to walk together and to be, to be strength for one another, you know? I mean, this is not easy. I used to have a basketball coach. He said, you know, if it's easy, everybody would be having it. And that was his way of saying this is going to be hard. (laughs) Uh, It's not very good grammar, uh, but it's it's really good wisdom. If church was easy, everybody would be having it, right? If walking with Jesus was easy, everybody would be having it. But to follow Jesus, to do works of Jesus, to multiply them and to expand the range of them means push back. It comes with a cost, but he's called all of us. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you today that you prepared us for the pushback um, and you received the ultimate pushback. You, you took the blows, you, you bore the scars of our sin, God. And because of that, we come to you as our Lord, our Savior, our Master, and as you called yourself, our friend. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would meet us in this moment. We thank you that you, though you went away and you're coming back and you're gonna resurrect um, all those that have gone before us. We have that hope, but right now, right down here on the ground, God, we wanna abide with you. We wanna walk with you and we wanna do that through your spirit. God, we pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit on us as individuals. We pray that you would pour your spirit on, out on us as a church. And we pray for the other churches in our community. Lord, just being reminded this week of what you're doing uh, in our city. Uh, Lord, there are so many good things in front of us. And there's some hard things. And so we pray, God, that we would not just uh, expect the great things, but we would walk through the hard things and we do it together. and We walk through it in faith. Because, Lord, our heart is that we want to experience the greater works not for ourselves, but for your name and for your glory. And so, Lord, teach us to abide in you. Teach us to remain in you, to walk intimately with you. And as we do that, we pray, Lord, that you would move through our city. You would move in this world like we haven't seen before. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.